Tom here from Lawrence Systems, and we're going to talk about the problem with Unify, specifically related to this new 6 version of the Unify controller software. And we're going to do a little lab demo here, breaking down you know the things I have here. I'll walk you through this lab demo. And it's also part of a scenario that apparently some people had some problems with with the update. And that's kind of what I want to dive into is uh, play with some real world technology here and show it working on the new controller. Also why I'm not ready to upgrade to the new controller, but maybe if you did upgrade and you didn't have problems, you should stay on it. So too long, didn't watch, you don't want to go to the end of this video. Uh, so far, it seems that if people have upgraded and don't have problems, it's probably worth staying on the controller. What happens if you upgrade and you have one of these scenarios? Well, it seems to be certain edge cases that break, and that's kind of the problem with Unify. But the problem is not really with Unify. The problem might be with who Unify sells to. And I'll dive into expanding on that here in the beginning, and then we'll jump to the lab, and I'll leave timestamps so you can skip around and not listen to me babble and get to the lab part if that's all you're interested in. Or if you weren't interested any further, you could have clicked already away. All right, if you can click the like button, though, and first, if you'd like to learn more about me or my company, head over to lawrencesystems.com. If you'd like to hire a short project, there's a hires button right at the top. If you'd like to help keep this channel sponsor free, and thank you to everyone who already has, there is a join button here for YouTube and a Patreon page. Your support is greatly appreciated. If you're looking for deals or discounts on products and services we offer on this channel, check out the affiliate links down below. They're in the description of all of our videos, including a link to our shirt store. We have a wide variety of shirts that we sell and new designs come out, well, randomly, so check back frequently. And finally, our forums. Forums.lawrencesystems.com is where you can have a more in-depth discussion about this video and other tech topics you've seen on this channel. Now back to our content. We'll start right here, and for some people, this is where all the trouble began. Well, more specifically with 6.020, which quickly turned into 6.022 as of September 19th, 2020. I do know there are some release candidates available, uh, but not really relevant to this particular video. I'm going to be doing this on 6.022 because that's currently what the controller I have set up uh, is running and what it wants to update to. I'm not getting prompted for any other updates, but I'm aware of release candidates coming down the pipe to solve more problems. But this issue is a lot bigger than this, and that's the first thing I want to address. And it's partly related to this type of scenario right here. This is a scenario I'm going to walk through a little bit later in the video. Like I said, it leaves timestamps. But this is not a scenario we usually set up, so we haven't really experienced this problem. And the bigger issue with Ubiquity, one, they have a niche market. Their niche market is a little bit of interest because they offer a controller that you can host that does things well, kind of at scale, some people can split hairs all day and say, well, it's not really enterprise because home users can get to it. And I especially know a lot of people in the business arena who really dislike anything home users have access to. They are absolutely headstrong on they only will buy products that are channel partner only and keep the general public away from it because I can't sell any product. And this is a quote I've heard from more than one IT person or IT company. I won't sell any product people can find the price on. They want channel partner only. They're used to high margin markups, et cetera, et cetera. This is what made Ubiquity disruptive in the market. They're going, hey, I'll sell it to people who are installers. I'll even sell it to anyone who wants to go on Amazon and get a link. I'll put the prices right on Unify. Uh, dot com and or ui.com now and uh, sell it directly to end users, home users. Anyone who wants to buy our product can buy it. And this is not the way of large commercial companies. They're used to finding channel partners and value added resellers who add very little value is generally my consensus for dealing with a lot of them over the years and my 20 plus years in IT here. And I've always liked when products have a easier sales model. And that is a good thing in the big picture, but when it comes to doing support and when it comes to dealing with problems, it can be a bad thing. I have worked with vendors. I have worked with companies that sell channel partner direct. So few people have access to this when you start talking about it. I say few, it's still millions. But when a product line has a problem, you're not going to see it in mass. Why it wasn't sold to the masses. The masses that may be using set equipment, and I'm not going to pick out any particular vendor except for one, Microsoft. And we deal all the time with updates coming from Microsoft that didn't go well. That's pretty much a regular process since Windows 10 came out, and hell, even longer before that. We've seen just 
you know, poor quality control and updates and things like that. That same type of behavior occurs repeatedly in the IT world. Uh, updates are hard, solving these problems are hard, writing code, not easy, and sometimes uh, it's poorly managed on top of being difficult. We have some poor management decisions being made by people who control the programmers and they push things out and people who work in corporate are nodding their head, oh yeah, I remember when they told me to push that update even though I, you know, 20 of the other people are going, don't do it, don't do it, but some sales guy wanted to meet a deadline that he promised to a client, so we pushed it out and the world lit up on fire. But you're not gonna hear about as much of the channel partner directs. They usually have more private forums. You usually just, even if they have forums at all, they're certainly not public facing most of the time. You'll end up with just a lot of people who call and complain to the vendor that pushed the update. And this goes, you know, I well, I pick out one more vendor, Fortinet, because I've done some videos about them. They've had some egregiously bad coding problems on there. But most home users, I would say almost no home users are running out and buying a bunch of Fortinet equipment to build out their network at home that's where Ubiquiti has a problem. Because they have sold to these individuals, and there is a lot of them, they make a substantially more noise than there's a problem. So what looks like a small problem, when you look at the scale and scope and size of Ubiquiti as a company and the number of units they deployed, you'll see that people are just ranting and raving, but then you start doing a count, and this is where you need that other side of the number. And the other side of the number is if there's you know, 2 million, 3 million units out there uh, broke down between some number of users, what percentage of those users are really having a problem? And me and Riley actually talked about this and even he said out of the, you know, massive things he hosts at Hostify, uh, the number of problems from some of the updates were definitely terrible for the people that experienced them, but as a percentage of the deployments as a whole, it was not 100%. It's not like 100% everybody had problems, so it's not like the entire update went wrong. And what happens is you see the noise because the people that pressed update and said, no, no, it worked and they didn't even bother going to the forums. An update came through, the update went through, uh, they never even looked at the forums. You don't have their voices in here. So unless you can get a concise, it just doesn't work that way, but this pretend we can get this analytical data that precisely we can get all the users who installed it, 100% of them, and report back. And then we figure out what percentage had a problem, then we would have a real number. I mean, I won't lie, there's plenty of comments on this post that tell me people had problems and problems need to be addressed. I'm not dismissing it. I'm trying to let people think about this from a rational business standpoint. And I've done this even with my staff many, many times where we walk through scenarios where they start complaining about a particular product and hard drives are an easy example of that. They'll go, man, this particular insert name of brand is a really bad, terrible hard drive, et cetera, et cetera but do you know how many of those were installed in the field? And that's where the numbers become interesting because if you say this hard, hard drive was bad, but 90% of systems, because they were a good price, uh, put those hard drives in because they were the best deal for OEMs to buy, well, the, of course they're gonna go bad if there's not another one out there. So as hard drives go bad, which they do sometimes, um, there's not other brands that people chose, they all chose this brand, so now, and this is why I like Backblaze for hard drive stats, you need to know how many total hard drives were there. Well, that's the, not the side you know. You only know people who had a problem because they brought it into the store and said, I need this fixed. Or you've seen it out in the field and go, well, I see all these fixed. But yeah, what's your basis of comparison? This is where statistics are really hard and people can easily manipulate those stats to kind of you know massage data the way they want. But back to my point and my whole ramble about this, I don't think it's time to throw away Ubiquity. I see people going, this is the end of the company. I'm switching and tearing everything out. And you know, we've been using these, we have these deployed. I'm myself not exactly thrilled with this update and I'm gonna hold off on it um, until I have more data available to me and you know, discuss with people some of these scenarios. But I will admit, this is just one of those real big challenges with Ubiquity is when you sell things to a mass market. Now other side of this. We do a lot of consulting and you know, I have a little spiel where I say hire us. One of the things people hire us a lot, a whole lot for is setting up Unify networks and troubleshooting them. And they are always super angry that Unify support did not give them the help they needed after buying the product. We don't find the product to be at fault as often as we find a misconfiguration, a loop in the network with people not turning spanning tree or people, and this is the other side of Unify when you hand it to end users, uh, People turn off auto because they know better. So they start tweaking every little 
whole setting in there. And sometimes it's easier to start over because they don't even, you know, they're not used to doing IT work, so they're not documenting and journaling. All right, these are the changes I made in case they need to revert changes. So that's my bigger complaint, so to speak, that the noise and people will listen to the noise and react to the noise as opposed to taking a concise look at it. Now, the other side of it, what's important about concise looks at it, this is a community. Unified develops this. They give out software. This is not something there's another. I, I can't get you a long list of companies that compete with Unify that give you self-hosted controllers because there's really not that many at all that I'm even aware of here in 2020. And I bring that up because, hey, if you are an innovative developer and you have some money and you can compete with Ubiquity and you'd like to do a self-hosted controller and copy the Unify business model, I'd be excited to talk to you about that product. But I don't know any of those people in that brings us to, you know, when you give all these knobs and things that people and end users can turn that aren't used to dealing with this equipment, but I'm not discouraging them to do it. Please, this is how you learn, but just don't separate the product and the noise, or do separate, I should say, the product and the noise so you can understand and get concise and then contribute back to Unify in some meaningful way. I know they do not listen to the users as much as they should or could, but at least if we start putting this information out there, we can work as a community to get this better. This is something I try to do a lot of, and that's why at the end of this video, well, after I'm done rambling here, I'm getting to the lab portion of this video to play out a scenario and show how it works and talk about some of the problems that someone, and this is uh, information from Hostify that they gave me of what troubleshooting he did and just walking through that scenario. So that's my rant about Unify. That's my rant about the end user community, which just like I said, I, I don't hate people or have any problem with the noobs or however you want to look at them or the new people getting out into network engineering. I'm happy that Unify still continues to sell a product that's very affordable for home users and kind of dive into networking and start building labs and things like that. It is unfortunate though when these updates don't go quite as planned. So that's uh, my end of rant. Now let's start talking about the lab and a scenario I have set up here. And we'll start right here with the Unify controller version. This is 6.0.220. And I know, like I said, there's release candidates coming up. I don't have the time to load those right now. We're just going to do it with what is currently available and more bugs may be fixed. And I know there's still some random issues that are being experienced and they've got them documented here. Known issues, VLANs beyond UAP wireless, uh, downlinks may have connectivity under investigation. So um, may not. And this is actually the part we're going to talk about because I'm actually showing connectivity here, but we'll talk about some of the scenarios that may lead to no connectivity. All right. So there's that. And we do have the map right here set up. And the map, uh, part of the reason that you see two of these, there's only going to be one in here. And the reason for only having one is uh, I was moving things back and forth in the ports here. Just FYI. So this is our USG uh, 16XG. Then we have a Unify Nano HD and a Unify Nano HD. And this dots here represent them connected wirelessly together. Then we have the USW Lite 16 PoE. And uh, we have Pop Top 480 is my laptop happens to be connected to it. Now we'll go over here to draw.io and get you a little bit better idea of what we have going on here. So the internet comes in and goes to this little SG 2100 I have sitting here. We create some uh, networks, which one VLAN, and we'll show that in a second here, but we just basically created one network uh, with LAN and one extra VLAN called VLAN 123. And this comes out of here and goes into the XG6 PoE. Then we go over here and power up a Nano HD. And then across here, we have the Unify Nano HD. And then we have it plugged into the Unify Switch Lite PoE that also powers this particular Nano. And then we have right here, my laptop plugged into port two, which we have set to VLAN 123. And this is where I found it kind of interesting for the errata where it says VLAN beyond UAP wireless. So Unify Access Wireless Point downlinks may not have connectivity under investigation. Now, hopefully, and maybe even some from Unify watches this video, and this is where scenario testing is really hard. This is documented from them that they know there's an issue and they've got updates coming. And now let's look at the settings here. So we'll go over here, we'll look at wireless networks. There's our, uh, whoop. Not, the wireless one doesn't really matter for what we're testing here. Um, we have our LAN native, 192.168.1. We have VLAN only set up and it's VLAN tag ID 123. Now we're gonna take a look over here at PFSense. Now here's the internet coming in over here. This is our little lab demo network. 
Then we have our LAN, which is technically VLAN 0, but 192.168.1.1. Then we have VLAN 123, which is 192.168.123. And then we'll go to Interfaces, Assignments, go over to VLANs, and you can see I have VLAN tag 123. So really straightforward, I just created a wide open network. We're not dealing with any rules, just basically so I can route traffic off VLAN 123. I then defined it right here in the Unify, and then I pushed out the network. Now, a couple other notices here is the way the wireless bridging works. Now, this is where the scenario gets to be something we usually don't set up. You have this Unify Nano, and we have another Unify Nano and we're actually bridging them together by turning on the ability to have them talk to each other. When we go here, we're gonna to go to wireless uplinks and this is off by default. You just put the little thing, click the, click the box and apply and it turns it on. Allow meshing to another access point. Now allow meshing to another access point and why I don't usually use this. People ask this all the question and I think a lot of people click that because they think meshing and roaming are the same thing. Uh, that is one of the most common things I watch people conflate when they're asking us network engineering question is, well, I need them all to mesh so I can just roam from one end of the building to the other. And I've heard of that exact sentence more than once. I've seen it typed in forums. And what people are conflating is they think they have to turn that on in order for this to be at one end of the building, this to be at another end of the building, and for them to wander with the device to connect to one, and when it gets to the other, it goes over the other. Unify does that by default. And the reason we don't use this type of scenario very often is because what, what you're doing when you do this is you're telling these two devices to talk to each other to get the data over here. So the data starts with my SG2100 and this XG6POE, and then we don't have a connection to this device. So when you tell them to wirelessly bridge to each other, it'll carry on the data. Now, I want to talk about scenario and why we don't like this. You now have to take and convert this cable right here to from cable to wireless, wireless, grab a couple of the antennas available for backhaul, convert them to wireless over here, convert them back over here, bridge them, carry all the VLAN traffic and now go back and forth while it's also providing wireless. It's actually great that Unify does this. This is a great scenario if you're in a pinch and you're going, I don't have any way to get a cable from here to here, but the devices are within range of each other to talk. But that range, obviously, because it's wireless, is very subject to interference. So anything in between these two, um, well, that's gonna cause latency and problems with this over here. So anything that disrupts that connection causes a problem. This is one of the reasons if we're deploying it in a business, just because something's at the far end of the warehouse doesn't mean, well, you know, we can hop these a few meshes over. That would be a problematic design because usually customers want extreme stability. We will wire every one of them. And people are saying, well, what do you do when a switch is, you know, so many meters away that it exceeds the distance of the cabling. Well, that's when we put fiber lines in or do some other methodology of extending it, or we build site to site bridges that are very dedicated and you do your due diligence to make sure these are focused. So this is not a scenario we use a lot, but a lot of home users, it turns out, do use this. And a lot of people in these edge cases were the ones affected by this. Now, this comes back to why the testing is so challenging. So we have this scenario and set up. And one thing I'll admit so far with the Unify 6, if you didn't notice this already, and why I went to draw.io, this tool here, to draw this out. Do you notice what's missing is it doesn't seem to know that this Unify Nano is connected to this USW Lite. And I'm not really sure why. It realizes this Nano, talks to this Nano, but it kind of mystery floats this one here going, I don't know how the internet gets there, but it's on my device list, guys. So the Unify mapping software, not that that means there's a problem with the way it runs, but this is something I didn't notice right away with the Unify 6. Uh, normally things on the other side of the wireless bridge show that way, but eh, this one's not. I thought that was interesting, or at least I don't look at this map very often, but um, I do recall at some point it used to work. I don't remember what version, if it's been broke for a while, um, I may not have noticed because like I said, I don't use it all the time. But um, because we don't use use a scenario, this is not one when we dealt with people who upgraded, they had a problem and this is what a lot of people um, seem to have a problem with that they went from five to six. But one of my points of building this was to show that despite the Unify mentioning VLAN span UAP not working, and let's go back over here, we're gonna look at the device, we'll look at the Unify switch here, and we look at what ports I have on here. So we've got port two, name port two, I didn't rename it, uh, test and the profile test. And what does that actually mean? So let's actually edit that port. We'll click edit on this. 
there's my test one, two, three VLAN that I have tagged to this port. So all is what comes down the ports. All traffic comes to the ports, but we've trunked it down to VLAN one, two, three. So what IP address did my laptop get? Because if you notice up here, I got the little thing. So let's see what IP address I got. And we'll uh, clear it to show this again to make someone happy that it wasn't statically sitting there, but 192.168.123.100, simple as that. So despite Unify having it and saying it's under investigation, this is also why it's under investigation and kind of back to my ramble a little bit. We know some people are having the problem. We actually worked, Riley had worked specifically at Hostify. He had helped a client troubleshoot this scenario. Now we set it up in a lab and it worked. And I don't recall exactly what they had done. It was based on a Reddit post and you can go in Reddit and find where people sometimes just readopted things and it just started working. This is also what makes it so challenging from a developer standpoint um, and why it's so hard work doing development is going, well, the developers and or even people like me, we labbed it out. I can't reproduce the problem. That doesn't mean the problem doesn't exist, but without knowing the exact scenario that produced it, um, I don't know. Now, granted, we also did not start at controller five, build this out and upgrade to six. At some point, I only have a finite amount of time. I didn't have time to do all that, but I wanted to test this particular scenario and putting VLANs across of a wireless bridge because I was told in, or at least seen forum posts where this didn't work. So we wanted to test this out and we did find out that it did work. Now, um, if there's more interest in me doing more lab videos like this, let me know, because um, they're kind of fun to do when I have time to do them. But you know, this is a pretty easy scenario to set up where you do the bridging and set these up. But like I said, this is more like an edge case and not something we actively deploy. So these lab ones are less about deployment. So if someone were to say, what's the long-term stability of it? Well, based on version six, um, certainly there's some issues with upgrades for it, but I don't know. I don't know what problems people run into because meshing these together is to me a really cool feature to solve an edge case. But um, our goal is always to hardline every single one of these to get a full connectivity for the best bandwidth possible and the least chances for interference. That way every device has essentially what we call to like a home run back to the switch. And you don't want the switches to try to keep bridging across, especially when I've done you know jobs that have 100 to 200 to 300 of these access points out there. Uh, you can imagine just turning on lots of bridging on there was definitely challenging. Now I will admit 6.020, and I commented when I did my other video, um, apparently somehow that got turned on. And one of the interesting things is right now, and we'll test this real quick, we will move this cable over to here, and then we're gonna take this one out of my laptop, and all I did was I'm going from here, and we're gonna go, let's break the bridge. Well, not break it, we're leaving the bridge enabled. But technically, if these two are bridged, and this is now essentially, you know, connected there, I should have a crazy broadcast storm going because I've now looped it. Now, it does have spanning tree in it, so that's supposed to prevent that. But I know in 6.020, this was one of the problems people had, was people who did do the essentially, you know, home run where you run each one of these to a switch, but then had that enabled so they would turn mesh on, they would just go into a loop of broadcast arm, and that was one of the original challenges people had. So at least that seems to have been addressed in the 6.022 but I'm not sure why people had that turned on. I didn't try, but a couple things. And so far when we've seen some of the updates, it didn't turn it on. So it leads me to believe some people may have had it on and we had it off. So we just don't turn that feature on unless it's absolutely necessary for a client. And like I said, we just don't use it that often. So it's uh, less of an issue. But if we go over here, um, after we refresh the page in a few seconds here, instead of saying connected wireless, it's going to say just connected and uh, it'll you know establish the connection on the back end that's what we're doing here hey look and uh, now it understands that even though this one is still showing connected to this now we can see that this is connected here and I'm getting routes over here so yeah and I I don't know how long it'll take before it switches and decides, oh yeah, by the way, that's connected hardline over there, but it's starting to update and do that. But I'm also not facing a spanning tree problem or anything else that's working properly. Now, granted, I set this up from scratch. I did not import just like I said from five. So those are my thoughts on the new version of the Unify software, the challenges with software development, the challenges when you have something you sell to a mass audience. Um, but I still 
don't get me wrong, Unify needs to do better. <laughs> and if uh, there was more competition in a the market, they would almost be forced to. Um, this is that big challenge we have, because I know people, the common forum question, every time there's a problem with Unify, people start hammering out, well, who's the best Unify competitor that lets me self-host my controller? I'm like, I, I don't really have an easy answer for that. Who's got a well-developed product? I'm not saying there's nothing out there, but I haven't seen anything quite as well-developed as Ubiquity. The downside of a product like this also comes from, it's complicated. There's a lot of coding that goes into this and uh, they're gonna have to make some decisions at Unify to kill some of the noise by making a product a little bit better and maybe spend some more, uh, hire some more engineers, which are really in short supply. So if you're thinking about diving into uh, coding and network engineering, which is, this is basically a collision of, um, that's not easy because people who do code net doesn't necessarily mean they were natively network engineers. So uh, I look at the challenges of writing this going, yeah, that's gonna be challenging. There's usually network engineering teams and there might be a programming team, but you kind of gotta be both to write uh, network software. It, it's not easy. Not that that gives them a free pass just to make updates that are kind of willy-nilly and they can always be more transparent. So um, that's my thoughts on it. I'm trying to be as rational as possible. I'm not ready to throw out Unify. I'm going to keep using your product and keep doing videos like this and keep, you know, posting and sharing community information of anything I can because, you know, we know some of the people from Unify, whether their management or not, are listening and maybe they look at it and they go, hey, let's, uh, that's a neat scenario. Let's uh, play this out differently and go from there. So keep posting the forums. Um, just be more rational and show you log files. That's another one. Just don't say it don't work. That is, that's a big problem. If you can show log files and document it better, that helps us and people like myself who troubleshoot things a lot more, and especially people who write this software troubleshoot it more. All right, thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon if you like YouTube to notify you when new videos come out. If you'd like to hire us, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out our contact page, and let us know what we can help you with and what projects you'd like us to work together on. If you want to carry on the discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can carry on the discussion about this video, other videos, or other tech topics in general, even suggestions for new videos. They're accepted right there on our forums, which are free. Also, if you'd like to help the channel out in other ways, head over to our affiliate page. We have a lot of great tech offers for you. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.